So um, <clears throat> my, my, my second talk uh, is um, uh, related to uh, transplantation uh, in the uh, management of aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Uh, and uh, as, as, as you can see, I put slightly different information here. Uh, and I, I'm to, trying to draw out some interest, uh, interesting features of the leukemia marrow transplant program in, uh, in British Columbia against the background of that title. So again, disclosures. The, um, the leukemia marrow transplant program uh, of BC is actually 30 years uh, old this year. Uh, the, first, uh, the first adult to undergo transplantation was in 1981. Um, and uh, the first uh, child was the year before. That, that patient is actually remains in remission uh, of acute myeloid leukemia 30 years after the transplant, having undergone the transplant when she was 19. And actually, interestingly, being told, because of the nature of the transplant and the radiation involved, that she would not be able to have children. But she went on and had two, uh, two children. So that it, I, I can't think of any better situation than the physician being proved wrong about something. Uh, second, that... Um, that I'm useless. <laughs> oh, sorry. I think I have... Yes. <laughs> well, how do you counter out to blackout? Okay, thank you. Okay, I must remember to press next. Okay. So the second point is, uh, in, in October last year, uh, the, uh, we had transplanted 3,000 patients uh, in the program. Uh, you'll see a slide later which seems to only suggest about half that number. The other half are patients, because I'm going to be dealing with donor transplants, half of that number are patients who underwent uh, an autologous transplant, that is a transplant with their own cells, typically for Hodgkin's disease and lymphoma and germ cell tumor. Um, and uh, the, the other disclosure is that um, I've actually been with the Leukemia BMT program since 1986, minus two years. Tom Neville rather facetiously said this was an extended sabbatical, which it wasn't. I, I was away back in England then. But it, it is a long time. And I, I don't know if you remember at the, the Oscars, um, Colin Firth, in his acceptance speech for the King's speech, said that he'd known a director for 20 years. And he said, uh, it must have been when I, was a, when I was a child sensation that I first saw him. I'd like to be able to tell you, uh, similarly, that I, I, my association with the Leukemia BMT group was when I was a medical student, but it wasn't. I was fully trained when I came here, so it's a long time. Um, so same slide. Um, I, I think that was a terrific description of PNH. The point being that with this disease, which is absolutely fascinating, sometimes patients can be anemia, anemic because they're breaking down the red cells. Sometimes they can be anemic because the marrow is not making red cells. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do, though, in terms of um, my description of uh, transplantation for those three diseases, at the end you'll see I'm going to spend quite a bit of time. I've selected three patients uh, from my experience over the years uh, and I hope the descriptions of those three patients will cover the treatment for those individual diseases rather than me showing numerous survival plots, which I think most people don't find particularly interesting, particularly this time of the afternoon. So again, this time I'm going to be talking about transplantation, but again, looking at the, the, uh, the bottom half of this, uh, uh, we've just heard new treatments come along and, and when a new treatment comes along, perhaps that changes our attitude to doing a transplant. As, as I think most of you know, and as I'm going to say, transplantation can be incredibly successful, but it can have many toxicities. And so I think what we're all striving for are these new targeted therapies, which hopefully are targeted as a specific abnormality in the disease. And, and by doing so, we are doing it in a loss, much less toxic way and a more effective way. So I think quite a number of us are quite keen for new targeted therapies to come along so that we're doing fewer transplants. But, as, but for the time being, at least, transplantation is a, a major part uh, of, of the management for some patients. Mm 
So the, the drug that for, for PNH that you heard about is uh, eculizumab, which um, is uh, a, a very impressive uh, new monoclonal antibody to, uh, to uh, address this problem in PNH where uh, the complement system, which normally functions to uh, rid the body of invading organisms or abnormal cells, because of the intrinsic abnormality in PNH, the, red, the patient's red cells are not protected from that reaction, and so the complement affects the patient's own red cells, causes major problems. So this monoclonal antibody will turn off that reaction in a very impressive way. So marrow transplantation. Actually, you, you, may, you may or may not be surprised that the first transplants go back to the <clears throat> late 1960s, uh, and really uh, it became a... a, 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 a successful maneuver really once we were able to distinguish um, uh, a suitable donor with the understanding of the HLA system, which uh, we did so in the 1960s. And the major center, there are a number of centers, of course, and you're always likely to offend someone if you select one, but I think the, the group that really led the way was the Fred Hutch Cancer Center uh, in Seattle, and they described this uh, system for doing a transplant, take a patient with a, 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 a marrow-based problem, uh, give very aggressive treatment, usually for about a week to try and empty the marrow, take donor cells and give them to the patient, uh, and then hope you get that, uh, those donor cells to take over the blood and the marrow. And as you can see, there's another component to this. This is graft versus host disease prophylaxis because the donor cells react against the patient and we need some medications to try and uh, tone down that, um, that um, reaction. So that's um, the, uh, the group in Seattle. And um, this, uh, this reaction, graft versus host disease, so this is once you've done the transplant and the donor cells then become active in the patient, the reaction is where the donor cells recognize the patient as non-self and react against the patient. And in the first 100 days of the transplant, we call that acute, and it typically affects the skin, the liver, and the gut. And in this example, I've just showed you know, this skin rash, but it can be a total body rash. So that's acute graft versus host disease. Um, and the chronic form is more like an autoimmune disease. By definition, it occurs later. And I've just shown you an example uh, in the mouth. So uh, for orientation, these are the teeth. And uh, this is a reaction in the uh, oral mucosa. And it can be very uncomfortable. So we see, as you sometimes do with autoimmune diseases, dry eyes, dry mouth, patchy skin rash, liver abnormalities, failure to thrive. So it can be a major problem. The upside to it was that the Seattle group, with publications in 79 and 81, showed a very clear relationship in that those patients that got this reaction, particularly the chronic form, were much less likely to develop recurrent leukemia afterwards. So as well as having a negative side, that is the donor cells reacting against normal tissue, the donor cells also reacted against any residual leukemia that hadn't been removed by the high-dose therapy. And so that's obviously very positive. And that was called graft versus leukemia. So we've got a graft versus leukemia effect. We know that it's not just leukemia. If you do this transplant for lymphoma or myeloma, you get a similar reaction. It's better called graft versus tumor, I suppose, but I've called it GVL throughout this talk. In some situations, and for some diseases like chronic myeloid leukemia, the actual graft versus leukemia effect, the effect of the graft, is more potent than the high-dose therapy is in terms of curing the disease. And there are di but every disease is sensitive to this reaction, but to varying uh, degrees. So that's an important point. Um, and uh, that work in Seattle, uh, the director was Don Thomas, and he was abor uh, awarded the uh, uh, Nobel Prize for uh, Medicine or Physiology in 1990 for, that, for the work of the Seattle group in uh, graft versus host disease, and sorry, in transplantation. Um, so the considerations, in, uh, I, I've just divided these up into the components of the transplant here, the consequences and the outcomes. Obviously, we always want the outcome to be cure, but sometimes that doesn't happen, either because of toxicity and the 
patient uh, may get overwhelming toxicity and die because of the transplant, the TRM, or the disease may come back again. Um, and uh, the components really are the, obviously, considerations. Uh, Tom Neville and Kirk Schultz went over this, the patient, the disease. I'll talk about the conditioning regimen, the donor, how we find the donor, and the actual cells that we use. And then the consequences, there can be some direct toxicity against normal tissue from the high-dose therapy, that's RRT, regimen-related toxicity. These patients are particularly susceptible to infection, particularly in the first year, but it can go for a number of years post-transplant. Graft failure doesn't really tend to be a problem. Um, if, if it's a, um, a matched sibling donor, we hardly ever see graft failure. If there's mismatch or it's an unrelated donor, we're maybe more likely to see it, but it tends to be fairly unusual. This reaction, the graft versus host disease, is the, the common reaction. And I've just put the two together because we're not, unfortunately, able to separate them. What we'd like, of course, is to have a dial that for a particular patient we would dial in a certain amount of GVH that gave you a good anti-leukemic effect and didn't trouble you too much. But unfortunately, we're unable to do that. Once you put the cells in, you, uh, in different patients, you get different outcomes. Um, the conditioning regimen, I really only showed this slide just to mention Gordon Phillips, who was really the, the, he was the first director of the leukemia transplant program from 84 to 94. And everything, uh, most of the things we still do now uh, was set up by him. And he was uh, a hugely inspirational leader for, for 10 years. Uh, and so with a conditioning regimen, really you want immunosuppression because as Kirk said, uh, we need to suppress patients' own immune system so that there isn't host versus graft. That is, you, the donor cells are not rejected. We want them to take. And there are various considerations. And we want to ablate, remove unwanted cells. Typically, those would be malignant cells in someone who's got leukemia or a clonal, uh, clonal uh, cells, uh, MDS, for example. And, and again, you've seen a variation of this slide from, from Kirk, so there's a bit of repetition. But this would, used to be the standard way. This is a patient, uh, head at the top end here, two operators. Actually, it's Gordon Phillips on your left and me on your right. And, and we're on both sides of the pelvis. And uh, we're doing multiple punctures to take, uh, we used to take uh, about a liter or uh, over a liter of marrow. It's so it's fluid, you pull it out with a syringe, uh, and um, actually, eat, most of you who've had a marrow sample taken won't have actually watched it because it's from the uh, posterior iliac crest, unless you've got eyes in the back of your head, I suppose, which you haven't. Um, and so, so we're doing multiple punctures here. Uh, the second way is to actually give the donor a growth factor, GCSF, and move the stem cells from the marrow into the blood and then collect them uh, on, a, on a, an apheresis machine, which just takes blood from one arm, spins the cells off that you want, and gives the rest back. The advantage, of course, for the donor is they don't have to have a general anesthetic. Um, the advantage for the patient is if you use stem cells that have come from the blood of the donor as opposed to the marrow, the blood count recovery is about a week faster, and the immune recovery is faster. So the early transplant course tends to be easier if you use stem cells collected from the blood rather than the marrow. The disadvantage is that if you use stem cells from the blood, they're more likely to give graft versus host disease uh, than uh, the stem cells from the marrow. What has become a bit of a misnomer is these are referred to as marrow transplants and these are referred to as stem cell transplants, which is wrong. They're both stem cell transplants. It's just that this one is a stem cell transplant where the cells have been uh, collected from the marrow and this is a stem cell transplant where they've been mobilized from the marrow and collected from the blood. Kirk also mentioned the bottom situation, this, uh, this glistening creature, which uh, I, it always makes me very queasy, and uh, so, so much so that I can't even f see the umbilical cord. But it's somewhere there, and uh, the point that he made was that there are enough stem cells in the umbilical cord to do a transplant, at least for a child. It be, it's more difficult to, to use these cells for an adult, where the, uh, sometimes we don't have enough cells. We are, like Kirk's group, doing umbilical cord transplants with two cords, but uh, it's not, it's not, our preference would be to find an unrelated donor, a standard unrelated donor. In a way, cord cells from a bank are an unrelated donor, but um, it's not our second choice. 
So our first choice is to get, if we've got a brother or sister that's an HLA match, uh, and our next choice is to look for a volunteer donor on a registry somewhere in the world. So these are individuals who, as you know, have signed up and said, if there is a patient somewhere in the world who, with whom I match, I'm willing to give my cells. And so our second course of action, if we want to do a transplant, unable to come up with a brother or sister as donor, we, we look for a so-called unrelated or volunteer donor through this um, one match process in, in Canada, but we have access to, through them to all the registries throughout the world. If we're unable to find a donor there, then we'll look for uh, cord cells in a bank somewhere. So uh, there's, I don't know, Kirk, I apologize, there's a bit of repetition here, but m maybe that doesn't hurt. Um, this is a standard transplant. It used to be, you could call it an ablative transplant. I'm calling it high intensity. And what I'm showing on here, the yellow uh, squares represent the marrow. The green dots are patient cells, and the red are donor cells. So standard high-intensity transplant, the first arrow, is with a week of very aggressive treatment and sort of emptying the marrow. You put the donor cells in, and usually within a short time, about a month, you get uh, close to fully donor in the, uh, in the marrow and the blood. And when it's fully donor, that it's all red in that box, then the patient's at risk of getting graft-versus-host disease. It tends, GVHD doesn't usually occur until you're close to being fully donor. Of course, you may get GVL as well, which is what we want. And of course, because this is high intensity, we get a lot of regimen-related toxicity. So that's a standard transplant. And more recently, at least say last 10, 15 years, we've also been trying to address the situation that a lot of patients um, are you know, in their 50s, 60s, and they are not able to tolerate this sort of approach as they might have been able to do when they were 30. And uh, so we've looked to do these reduced intensity transplants, or for patients who maybe have coexisting medical conditions. And here, again, same sort of symbols. Oh, take a patient, these are the, donors, the, the patient cells, uh, we give some therapy, that's the first arrow, which is reduced intensity, so it doesn't completely empty the marrow. And you go through a phase where there's a mixture of donor and patient cells, so that's the red and the green together at about a month. The attraction is if at that stage you don't get graft versus host disease because you've got to be close to being fully donor to get GVHD. So you get the, you get the cells in, you delay the graft versus host disease until the effect of the, high, the therapy has worn off, uh, and then you manipulate the situation over the next few months by stopping the immunosuppression or giving some more donor cells to create a fully donor. When you get fully donor, then again, the patient can get graft versus host disease and graft versus leukemia. But this is a way of delivering a transplant, hopefully in a, in a, a less aggressive way and therefore less toxic. So indications for transplant, whole list here, including you know, different types of leukemia, lymphoma. But for this talk, of course, we're talking about aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, and PNH. And uh, this is the pie diagram for the transplants that we have done from that very first one I mentioned to you, that young woman with acute myeloid leukemia in 1981, right the way through to the end of 2009. We're going through an economy drive within the department, so we're only allowed to have the slides updated every two years. So you've, you've missed out. If This time next year, I could have shown you the slide up to the end of 2011, but Dr. Shepard won't let me. So, this, so you can see at the top north here, aplastic anemia accounts for about 2% of our, trans, our donor transplants, and um, myelodysplastic syndrome about 10%. The, the relatively few cases of PNH transplants are within other. And then, as you can see, two-thirds are for leukemia and then also for lymphoma and chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia. So that's the breakdown. And what I'm now going to do, uh, just at the end of the talk, I've, I've insert, what I'm hopefully going to do is I've selected three patients um, from th those that I've looked after over the years. And the hope is that these three patients who, one 
uh, aplastic anemia, one myelitis plastic syndrome, or one PNH, uh, are good examples of, of the field and, um, and, and, and the outcomes that, that are possible. So this patient was, 50, the UPN is a unique patient number. So every patient in our program uh, gets a number. Uh, for, for, uh, for those that get a transplant. So these are all three peak patients who've had transplants, UPN 1499. And um, he presented in May 1998 with aplastic anemia. So he's mar he, he's previously well, no medications, very low blood counts, marrow sample completely empty. Um, and uh, we made a diagnosis of aplastic anemia. The neutrophil count was 0.3, so that put it in the category of severe aplastic anemia. He was dependent upon blood transfusions and platelet transfusions, and we treated him with standard of care, and that's what it was in um, 1998. It still is uh, a combination of antithymocyte globulin and cyclosporin. What we would normally expect with that, and the long-term results show it, that at six months, about two-thirds of patients should have responded. In actual fact, the long-term results for this treatment are very good. Um, they could be better. All, all results could be better, but I think about 50% of patients will su survive for long periods of time with good, with good blood counts. So it's an effective treatment, but, but in his case, it wasn't because at six months, the marrow looked exactly the same as it had at diagnosis, and he was still requiring blood transfusions and platelet transfusions. So by then, we found that he and his sister shared the same HLA type, so we offered him a transplant. And because uh, he, the, the, the immune, immunosuppressive therapy had not worked, that seemed an appropriate thing to do. So the conditioning regimen for that was a combination of cyclophosphamide and antithymocyte globulin, which is the same today, uh, the allograft uh, then was marrow for, for all patients having a transplant. And interestingly, for aplastic anemia, it's still marrow because, as I said to you, the, if we take stem cells from the marrow of the donor, we think there's less likelihood of getting bad graft versus host disease than if we take the stem cells from the blood. And because in this disease, we don't need graft versus host, we don't need a graft versus leukemia effect. This is basically an empty marrow. We're trying to do a transplant. In fact, we don't really want them to get graft versus host disease. So we would have done this exactly the same way now. However, he did go and get graft versus, chronic graft versus host disease of the mouth and the liver, which was controlled with immunosuppression, including prednisone, and later had a lung reaction. Sometimes chronic graft versus host disease can affect the lung an erection called bronchiolitis obliterans, which can be quite nasty. In his case, it was self-limiting. And so uh, at the recent, most recent follow-up, which was January this year, he was well uh, off all transplant medications. He was on some medications not related to the transplant. Normal blood count, 13 years post allograft. So if you ask, is that a typical case? I would say yes, not particularly typical in terms of the fact that the Immunosuppressive therapy failed him, didn't work. That's not particularly typical, um, but it can happen. In terms of the result to the, with the transplant, yes, I mean, if you look at the results of allogeneic transplants using a sibling donor for patients with aplastic anemia, then they are very good for adults as well as for, you know, remember those curves that Kirk Schultz showed? They're obviously excellent for children, but the results for adults are also good. So I would put to you this is a fairly typical um, case of aplastic anemia treatment with a transplant. Now, the, the next one is more recent, as you can see from the UPN. Uh, this is a 54-year-old woman that I saw in the summer of last year, and she presented with a, 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 a myelodysplastic syndrome, which was refractory anemia, excess blast, uh, which um, type 2, so that puts it in the, the higher-risk group. And uh, at that time, she was well. Uh, we then typed her siblings and found she didn't have a match. And in a very short time, from when we, a few months later, the disease had transformed into acute myeloid leukemia. So we brought her into hospital and gave her chemotherapy and achieved remission. She had more cycles of chemotherapy as consolidation. And then by then, we'd come up with an unrelated donor uh, through our searches. It usually takes a number of months and you use the chemotherapy to buy time. Um, so we carried out an unrelated donor transplant uh, 
in first remission uh, using uh, uh, blood cells from the donor. And the post-transplant course was relatively uneventful, did not get any graft versus host disease. In fact, the counts were low, and it was uh, quite worrying that the marrow taken at three months post-transplant uh, uh, had quite a lot of dysplasia. So now uh, the original disease, the MDS, was obvious on that marrow sample, uh, and she'd not had any graft versus host disease. So that is usually a, a stimulus to get patients off the immunosuppressive therapy, that's the cyclosporine, very quickly, which I did over two weeks. And then a remarkable, not interesting thing happened. Uh, she developed graft versus host disease in the mouth, the skin, and the liver, and the marrow, which had showed dysplasia, now looked normal. Um, usually we have a marker for the disease, like a chromosomal abnormality, or if there's a sex mismatch between donor and patient, we can show that the cells here are, are all donor. Her donor was female, and her chromosome count uh, uh, analysis was normal on her, on her disease, and the blood groups of the patient and the donor were the same. So we had nothing to go to, and we just have to go with what the um, pathologists say. And, um, but I think what happened was she came off the cyclosporine, got graft versus host disease, also got this graft versus leukemia or graft versus myelodysplastic syndrome effect, and now has a normal-looking marrow. And she's um, well, uh, uh, short follow-up, of course, but well on prednisone, and the graft versus host disease is controlled. And I show this as a fairly typical example of a disease, the higher-grade myelodysplastic syndrome that can transform to acute myeloid leukemia, and the fact that key to the efficacy of transplantation is that the, of this anti-leukemic effect of the graft, and if you don't get it, you have to have, you come up with some maneuver to try and bring it about. Now the final case um, is a, a patient a nine, who was 19 when he presented with PNH, and um, he presented with a profound anemia with a hemoglobin, I think, about 50, uh, due to severe hemolysis, uh, and um, uh, the, the PNH clone was high at 90%. Uh, he, he was managed with uh, transfusions at that time, and then in March 2004 uh, became very unwell and developed another complication of this disease, which is blood clot. And he had um, uh, a clot uh, that had gone from the legs to the lung and also had a serious clot in the, uh, in the abdomen, in the hepatic vein. So he had to be anti fully anticoagulated, um, and then he was referred to me for consideration of a transplant. Um, because of the, the problem with the hepatic vein, when we looked and did a liver biopsy, his liver was quite abnormal, and we were worried if we did a full transplant that he would get overwhelming toxicity. So we decided to do a reduced-intensity transplant for him with fludarabine cyclophosphamide, even though he's a young man. And uh, again, um, he, uh, he uh, did well, we had to take off the cyclosporin fairly uh, promptly because at that time the percentage of donor cells was quite low. I think it was about 30, 40 percent. And once we'd taken them off the cyclosporin, the percentage of donor cells came up. He did get graft versus host disease, uh, but he, he's been off immunosuppressive therapy for a long time now, and he's been off anticoagulation, which, as you can imagine, for a young person in his 20s, does not want to be fully anticoagulated because his physical activities is being restricted because of the risk of bleeding on anticoagulation. So when I saw him in the summer, he was well, uh, off, off transplant medications, no evidence of PNH, normal blood count, five years post-transplant. The interesting thing is, I think in today, uh, uh, the treatment may have been different uh, if we'd had access to this new uh, agent, and we probably would have made a, a good case uh, to treat him with the uh, monoclonal antibody and um, instead of doing a transplant. But we didn't, of course, that this was some, some years ago. So um, a sort of bit of a romp through transplantation. Is it, is it, is it the ideal food? Not always, but it, it can be absolutely terrific. Uh, you can never take it for granted, though. There are lots of side effects, lots of toxicities, and unfortunately some of those are out of our control, um, and uh, we do our best. Uh, um, however, at the present time, it, donor transplantation, allogeneic transplantation, is still uh, a, a significant part of our management plan for quite a number of patients with uh, 
myelodysplastic syndrome, aplastic anemia, uh, and occasionally for PNH. So um, a number of acknowledgments again, uh, the, particularly this time to the uh, Leukemia Marrow Transplant Program, numerous individuals involved in the program. I'll just make a particular mention of uh, Janet Nita and her team who looks after all the information and supplied quite a lot of this information uh, in, the, in the talk, and that's our, um, that's our webpage. Thank you. Thank you.